Hello, my name is Andrew Hendry. I'm a professor in the Red Path Museum and the Department of Biology at McGill University. Now, what I want to do today is give the introductory material for a couple of lectures on fish. Fish diversity, fish evolution, fish behavior, fish locomotion. Nested within the overall larger context of the course of animal diversity. Now, in order to introduce my lectures on fish, what I want to do is I want to try and bring you to a couple of places in the world and tell you about some of the fish that I've been able to record, observe, and study in those places. And I'm going to take you to two places. The first is Galapagos, and we'll look at marine fishes in the Galapagos. And the second one is to my cabin in northern British Columbia, where I'll talk a lot about salmon, but also the other fish that are found in that general area. Now the first place I want to take you is to the Galapagos Islands and take you underwater off the coast of the Galapagos Islands on little sea mounts where you have a lot of upwelling from the deep ocean which when brought to the surface generates lots of productivity and you have lots and lots of fish present. That's true of the Galapagos as a whole and also the specific locations where I'm going to bring you some underwater footage. Now in this particular segment what I'm hoping that you'll get from it is an understanding of the way in which fish move through the water using different fins to generate locomotion and maneuverability. So focus on how the fish are moving, interacting with the environment, and which fins they're using. These Galapagos white tip reef sharks are doing what's called corangiform swimming, which is with the caudal fin and the back part of the body using a tail that is asymmetrical. It's called heterocircle. In this video here, you're gonna see several different males mating with a female. They actually bite onto her pectoral fins and mate with her. Propulsion in many, perhaps most fish, is via this corangiform swimming using the back part of the body, the trunk, and the caudal fin. One thing to look at here, as you look at all these fish using corangiform swimming, is the shape of the homocircle caudal tail. It varies dramatically depending on how they live their lives. If you do a lot of constant swimming in the open water, you want a high aspect ratio tail, like a tuna, that has minimal drag, as in these rainbow runners here. Now let's take a look at locomotion done by fins other than the caudal fin. And here you see a mola mola, and it is uh, moving primarily by means of the dorsal and anal fins. The mola mola tends to oscillate these fins back and forth, kind of like paddles, rather than moving waves along them. Mola molas, of course, are super cool, weird fish, getting massive sizes, the largest bony fish in the world. But amazingly, they can actually still jump pretty well. So in addition to seeing this one underwater, you can see them leaping out of the water in Galapagos. It's pretty amazing. Perhaps the coolest use of the dorsal and anal fins for locomotion is found in trigger fish where they're not just oscillating the fins back and forth, but rather undulating waves along them. And so here you have a surgeon fish that's trying to make dinner out of an urchin and keep it uh, away from the other fish that are trying to eat it as well. This is called blistiform swimming after this type. Of this video is not taken sideways. Instead, it's along a wall in Galapagos. And what you're seeing on it is a marbled ray, which is going to demonstrate another type of swimming. Continuing with this theme, spotted eagle rays use their pectoral fins, as does the marbled ray, and they undulate or oscillate it along, moving through the water on a slow glide. Now this type of swimming is typical of skates and rays. It's called ragiform, which again is named after the group, and they are amazing critters. Here is a stingray on the bottom that is rooting around in the sediments and it's surrounded by a bunch of puffer fish that are trying to get a free meal of things that are stirred up. Now puffer fish move mostly by just their caudal fin being stabilized, also by movements of the pectoral and dorsal fins. This is called ostracoform swimming, and they're demonstrating it here. And now the stingray is taking off. This stingray actually lost the end of its tail, so its sting is actually missing, uh, but it seemed to be doing quite all the fine for that. Skates and rays will sometimes be present in huge uh, shoals like this or schools. These are golden cow rays. Now watch this. They're swimming along and all of a sudden something shoots down from the water and panics them all. When this happened, we didn't know what to make of it. 
my daughter, who was filming at the time, uh, had the presence of mind to go up to the surface. And as you'll see here, it's actually a pelican. It wasn't after the eagle rays, but it scared them nonetheless. And let's have time for one more. Here's some older video. These are garden eels that are in burrows in the ground and they stick their heads up and they feed on plankton drifting by. Garden eels show a different type of swimming where they undulate their body. It's called anguilliform swimming after the true eels, the anguillids. It's basically a uh, snake-like motion. I want to close this Galapagos stuff with just a description of a really cool set of behavior. Many resident species are territorial and defend little algae gardens, particularly damselfish. Now they can chase off one intruder, but they can't chase off whole shoals of them. And so here's a shoal of yellowtail surgeon fish that are doing that. Okay, so that's it for Galapagos. Now I want to take you to my cabin, which is in northern British Columbia. And here what I want to do is I want to talk to you about fish that are found in freshwater. There are a couple of important themes in these videos. One of those is the movements of organisms between the ocean and fresh water. And so those life histories will be something that are important in this set of introductory videos. And another thing that's going to be interesting is how fish look after their young. Where do they reproduce? Who's the parent that looks after them, male or female or both. And you'll see some contrasting life histories and parental strategies in these videos. So one of the uh, coolest, more primitive fishes are the lampreys. In lampreys, they don't have a jaw. Instead, they have an oral disc. And they have some really interesting life histories. For example, a lot of the species are anadromous. That is, they go to the ocean and they come back into fresh water where they breed, at lay their eggs, and then the babies live for a while in fresh water. So, at our cabin uh, is one of the places where lampreys spawn, and then you can get uh, lamprey babies, which are a different form called an amacete. So, uh, the kids just found one here, and so let's take a look at it. So this is a lamprey amacete, but it's beginning to change into the size and shape it will go a long migration, hundreds of kilometers down to the ocean, where it will then uh, take up a parasitic life cycle in the ocean. In the sand and gravel and mud of many northern rivers, there are a lot of lamprey that are there for up to seven years, living a filter feeding life cycle as an amacete. And then they'll all metamorphose, go out to the ocean, become parasitic on other fish, get really big and then swim all the way hundreds of kilometers back up these rivers to spawn and lay their eggs back in their uh, natal streams. So here are a bunch of baby coho salmon, juvenile uh, coho salmon called par, that are hanging out in a shallow area of the stream. Now coho salmon are really famous for occupying these little side channels that get isolated from the main stream and just hanging out there for most of the summer until the water levels increase and then they can go back out into the main stream and the following spring migrate to the ocean where they will take on an anadromous life cycle. So here are a bunch of uh, coho salmon sped up so you can see how they're holding their position in the current, using their caudal fins at the end, anal fin on the bottom with the white line, which is what tells you it's a coho salmon, among other things. And you can see all the little fine fin movements that help to maintain their position as they're foraging in the, uh, the slight current. So these are pink salmon that are swimming up the stream on their way back uh, to their natal, that is their home spawning areas, in uh, headwater streams like where our cabin is. These migrations are very difficult for salmon and they have to overcome many obstacles. These salmon, for instance, have migrated several hundred kilometers up the Skeena River to get to our cabin here. They have to overcome many obstacles, most obviously are waterfalls. And so you hear, here you see pink salmon that are attempting to leap, leap up a waterfall that is just upstream of our cabin. Waterfalls are also places where animals and people have long uh, been able to exploit salmon uh, and indigenous people in particular traditionally would use nets and gaffs to harvest salmon. Coho salmon, which really like to spawn in shallow waters, have to encounter beaver dams. 
So here's a very small beaver dam that the salmon are surmounting without much trouble. But there are larger beaver dams that often have shallow water below them that make it hard for the salmon to get up. And so I have this video of uh, a whole bunch of salmon trying to leap over this one waterfall. And as you can see, many of them don't make it. Some of them get kind of stranded. And I was watching and got kind of nervous at this poor salmon. And so I tried to put it back in the water. Uh, I wanted to put it upstream, but it ended up downstream. Sometimes they make it. And so here you can see that they leap up out of the water so they can jump the really fast part of the main current. And then they land on the top and swim really, really hard to make it up above the waterfall. Here's what it looks like uh, from uh, underwater. Sometimes they have to mount much larger obstacles like this big beaver dam here. Now in this case, there was sort of a hole in it which the salmon tried to swim up in the very fast current. You can see that the salmon have a hell of a time swimming up this incredibly fast current. And so these again are coho salmon trying to make it up in the fall. And I've slowed it down here so that you can see that when they are successful, it's the result of these really strong propulsive movements of the caudal fin in the back half of the body. Eventually, if salmon make it over all the barriers and make it past the beaver dams and such, they end up in their natal spawning area. This is their home spawning area where they were hatched as uh, young and that they imprinted on with chemical cues to make sure they found their way back. These are Chinook salmon. These are pink salmon right in front of our cabin. And in some years, uh, there are tons of pink salmon that are present in these locations, all spawning in the gravels. One of the really cool things about pink salmon is that they have a strict two-year life cycle. So there are odd-year salmon runs and even-year salmon runs of pink salmon. Once they uh, find their spawning areas, there's a lot of competition among the males for access to females. And the males develop these large secondary sexual characteristics, such as this big hump on the male salmon and the really sharp teeth on the males as well, that they bite and compete with each other. And in this sped up video, you can see the three males behind a female that's building her nest. And the three males are sort of all navigating and pushing against each other and displaying and sometimes biting intensely at each other to try and gain access to the female so that when she lays her eggs, they will be able to fertilize them. The females, meanwhile, are focused mainly on choosing the right place to build a nest and then digging in the gravel to um, create a nest pocket or pit in which they will lay their eggs. This is important because it gets a lot of the fine sediments out of the gravels, which would otherwise suffocate the eggs that are in the gravel, because the eggs have to incubate over the entire winter and then only hatch in the spring. Uh, and here you can see a female removing a lot of the fine sediment from her nest by turning on her side and uh, digging her tail as though she were swimming, but she turns sideways and does that to force water into the gravel and therefore um, find sediments out. Eventually, she'll build a nice nest like this one. So you can see where she is right now. Um, she's digging and she's removed a lot of that really fine sediment. And there's only sand left and larger rocks. And she is continually trying to improve this nest while the males jockey for position around her. And when she has prepared the nest to her satisfaction, she will release her eggs. Males will rush in and uh, release milt, which is sperm, to try and fertilize those eggs. Again, like we did with the juvenile coho salmon, it's fun to speed up the action so you can see the interactions where females are competing for nest sites and fighting with each other. Males are competing with each other for access to females and I'm filming. I wanted to give anecdotes about several of the other fish that are found uh, around our cabin. These are white fish here and what it's doing is it's going around where the pink salmon have been laying their eggs and it's uh, siphoning up eggs off the bottom as well as insects, which is its normal diet when the salmon are not spawning. But when the salmon are there, everything wants to eat their eggs. Then of course, the salmon need to make it all the way out when they uh, transition from par into what's called a smolt, which are the downstream migrants toward the ocean. And they need to run a gauntlet of predators such as Northern Pike. You can see the, all the fins toward the back. So this is an ambush sit and wait predator that waits until a salmon gets close and then really quickly uh, propulses itself forward to catch that uh, salmon. There aren't pike present in the river where my cabin is, but they are in some of the other rivers nearby. But nowadays, a lot of my effort is directed toward research on stickleback. This is a three-spined stickleback found in a lake in Haida Gwaii, which is not that far from our cabin, and it's tending its nest. 
So it has opened up its nest a little bit and now is using its fins to pass water over it and thereby make sure they have enough oxygen. Stickleback males are the caregivers here where the females just come in, deposit their eggs. The males then release sperm over the eggs and then look after the nest and the eggs and the babies. We do a lot of research on stickleback, including introductions into lakes from which stickleback have been extirpated as a result of the northern pike. And here we are releasing a bunch of stickleback into a lake in Alaska that are swimming off to live their happy lives and found a new population that we can study the ecology and evolution of as the lake is being restored by the reintroduction of this critical keystone species. Now there's going to be an assignment for you that is going to be done in the lab. What I'd like each of you to do is pick two really interesting fish. And they can be whatever fish you want. And I'd like you to construct one slide for each of them that tells some of the interesting things about that fish, meaning that fish species. It could include video, it could include pictures, and text that represents some of the most important or interesting features in bullet form. Just a single slide for each of two fish and then you're going to present those to the other students in the lab period and then we will use that material for the rest of the lab. Make sure you have it ready before you go into the lab because it's a critical part of the lab component. Cheers, good luck, happy fishes.